Welcome to Hell War Stories. In this episode, I'll be discussing the life of Keith Stone. Keith Cardell Thomas was born in 1961. Like many of his friends, Keith had no father in the house. He lived in a two-bedroom bungalow-style home on Cimarron Street. His mother was a UCLA graduate and public health nurse for the county. But she struggled to raise two sons on her own. Although she did manage to provide the basics of a middle-class life, Keith used to collect pigeons and play Little League Baseball. When he was 13, Keith's mother took him and a cousin to a West Los Angeles bank. It was there where a teller suspected that the two teenagers were robbers, not because of their behavior, but because of their physical appearance. More than a dozen police officers showed up and pointed their guns at Keith and his cousin, who were the only black youths at the bank. I didn't do nothing. Keith cried as his mother pleaded for the officers to hold their fire. The misunderstanding was cleared up, but the incident remained a confusing trauma in his life. As a teenager at Crenshaw High, Keith stood behind his fist and never shied from a challenge. Even when the taunts came from older or bigger kids, later on when he became an OG, he would routinely invite 50 friends to his place, send out for $500 worth of barbecue ribs, and crack open a few bottles of Hennessy. There were also times where he had to take care of business. Keith could be ferocious and merciless, but Keith operated by a code. You didn't shoot little children or somebody's mother let alone fire in a cemetery, hospital, or church. A dispute might still turn murderous, but it was understood that that beef was only with that rival, not his entire gang. A Rolling 60 member who asked his name not be used once said, yeah, Stone was an OG with real love for the set. He wasn't down for all that gang banging, senseless killing shit. Now I ain't gonna say he ain't never did no shooting, but it wasn't like these kids now, who shoot nine or 10 times, then open their eyes to see who they hit. When Stone was coming up, it was easier to live by such rules, in part because not everyone had a gun at that time. If they did, it was most likely to be a 22, not some imported military-style rifle that could fire 16 rounds without reloading. Drive-bys were also kept in check because few could afford a car. Keith was convicted in 1988 of a burglary and being accessory to a robbery. His gang was synonymous with neighborhood, and you protected the neighborhood by not turning every dispute into a war. Keith would even party with rivals, walking 60th Street down a Century Boulevard. In the 80s, California replaced Florida as the chief port for the Colombian cocaine cartels. Weapons were circulating widely. Easy money was close behind. The most aggressive and ambitious members of the rolling 60s, lacking other economic opportunities, did whatever necessary to survive. The ones with entrepreneurial abilities, who may be because of lack of resources or positive family structure, didn't go to college, but took to the streets. Keith was not going to turn his back on the action. He organized drug selling crews that bounced out to other states. He bought speedboats, all-terrain vehicles, and a classic 63 Chevy with hydraulics. When he supplied his people with guns, he cautioned them to not hurt anybody that don't gotta be hurt. He bought a gated home at the base of Windsor Hills, which is one of the wealthiest black neighborhoods in America. His home was fully equipped with a gym in the den and big screen to watch the Raider games. On the weekends, drug profits fueled high stake games of dice and dominoes. When dope hit the scene, he grabbed it, sold it, and rose to prominence. But Keith did not approve of his friends using cocaine, and he did not deal in his own community. He generously shared his wealth, buying remote controlled model airplanes for poor youth, and opened his home to anybody who needed a safe place to chill when the streets got too hot. But then on January 30th, 1992, Keith headed up to Duarte in a rented Ford Explorer. He came with a friend who had driven the SUV down from Seattle. They came to visit a dude wild crib named Anthony, also known as Ant Dog. Keith, who was 30, had trusted the younger Anthony, who was a regular guest at his home in Windsor Hills. They had been in the co-signing business for years. Keith fronted the weed, then returning to collect a cut out of the profits. However, when Keith put up outside of Anthony's house this time, he was ambushed. Having blown Keith's money, Anthony had decided to jack his supplier. Keith and his friend Danny were ordered face down at gunpoint, then handcuffed and blindfolded. The Ford Explorer was ransacked. You ain't gotta do us like this, cuz, Keith said. But the dude while Crips had no exit strategy. They had gone too far to let Keith go. The two men were told to crawl into the back of the SUV. They were covered with a shower curtain and tablecloth, then driven several miles north into the thick of an avocado grove. Keith was shot once in the head, and so was Danny. The Durocs took off in another car, leaving the victims to When word of Keith's murder began to spread, 
Even rival hoods were shocked. It was unthinkable that someone of his stature, a warrior and a survivor, would die not in battle, but in betrayal. Four Dubai Crips were ultimately convicted of his murder. Keystone was different from the new generation of gangbangers, who were often blinded by the lure of fast cash and gold chains. He clung to an old-fashioned code of honor, cautioning that greed within his ranks was undermining the spirit of unity and devotion. I'd like to thank you guys for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.